Hi there. Welcome to Headwaters Science Institute's Lunch with a Scientist. Join us as we talk with working scientists from all over the world as we explore what science research in their career actually looks like. We will host a new scientist every other week and allow them to present their research and follow that up with an open-ended question and answer session. We hope exposure to these professionals will allow students to not only see what type of research is possible, but also see what kinds of careers are accessible. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun along the way. So this is a NOAA P3 uh, flying into uh, an eye of a hurricane. You can experience anywhere from uh, one to two Gs up and one to two Gs down. And you can begin to see some lightning flashes in the eye wall. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to fly through an eye of a Category 5 storm. It is, it is a career high. No. Yeah. So, like I said, it's either something that you love with a passion or you want to change jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this week's Lunch with a Scientist. Today, we are joined by Jeff Hawkins. Jeff has worked in the field of meteorology since the 1970s. He is now a retired satellite meteorologist and oceanographer. He works part-time as a consultant for NASA as well as Northrop Grumman. He's also a volunteer for uh, the Marine Mammal Center in Monterey, California, where he does work with animals like seals and elephant seals, which I think is really cool. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and welcome Jeff to the program. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jen. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little life experiences. I initially uh, grew up in Miami, and uh, in the early uh, 60s, uh, we got run over by uh, three different hurricanes, uh, Donna, Cleo, and Betsy. And as you might expect, that left a little lasting impression, in addition to the fact that my dad was a meteorologist and actually had the opportunity uh, to fly into hurricanes. So I thought that was um, an interesting uh, passion, uh, needless to say. Uh, but growing up, I also had the opportunity to do a lot of uh, skin diving in the Florida Keys and basically became enamored with marine biology. So I started my studies in marine biology and quickly discovered that uh, the job opportunities at that time were few and far between. So I switched majors, as I'll discuss in a minute, to meteorology, and that has uh, basically uh, been my lifelong passion in terms of oceanography. So I've been able to mix meteorology and oceanography throughout my career, which has been uh, very satisfying. So I'll move on from there. And uh, this gives you an idea <clears throat> of a track of one of the storms that um, basically ran right over my house in Miami. And um, we had the opportunity to go down in the Florida Keys and, and see, unfortunately, the, the devastation. So it brings, uh, brings uh, the whole message home that at this time, uh, forecasting hurricane tracks was uh, difficult. However, we've made considerable progress uh, in that time frame, such that uh, track force forecasting is, is very accurate. So here's uh, why I became interested. Just to recap what I said, this is a picture of my dad flying back in the 60s in an old uh, DC-6. And basically, he discovered that um, he had a love for combining uh, meteorology theory, in other words, what's happening and why, uh, with uh, field programs like this flying into uh, hurricanes. And that basically uh, captured my attention, how you could basically go out and participate in field programs uh, to learn uh, how better storms work. And my dad got his PhD in the 1960s uh, at uh, Florida State University, which I happened to go to, but I went there as a marine biology major. And uh, after my freshman year, I basically discovered the job prospects were poor and I was bored, for lack of a better word, uh, doing uh, biology and chemistry. So I switched my major to meteorology and ended up getting a bachelor's and master's degree at Florida State. One of the items that I really like to harp on 
is that folks uh, dip their toes into whatever it is that they're potentially interested in early in their career. So while I was an undergraduate, I worked as a uh, part-time summer technician for the National Weather Service in Tallahassee at basically the lowest possible level, basically changing paper tapes on a, a machine that was measuring uh, incoming solar radiation. Uh, later in my graduate career, I had an opportunity to intern at the National Weather Service in Tallahassee and basically became certified as a weather observer. And I discovered then that uh, the National Weather Service was not likely what I wanted to pursue at that particular time. And then I also had an opportunity to intern at the Hurricane Research Division, where I had an opportunity to uh, fly into a hurricane. And that basically uh, turned me on and uh, captured my attention, uh, especially with regards to uh, the individual I was working with uh, on air-sea interaction. So when you're working in meteorology as a college student, basically math and physics uh, form the core of what you're doing. So calculus and beyond, dynamics and thermodynamics and physics. Meteorology is basically a blend of math and physics to explain the atmosphere and how it works. So it is a science. It's not a guessing game. We have come a long way, obviously, in the 40 some odd years since I started. Uh, to the fact today that weather forecasts, whether it be temperature, precipitation, and winds, uh, have reached a, a new level of um, basically satisfying a wide range of user needs. So I encourage each student to find what fascinates them the most. You know, what strikes your fancy? What is your passion? So <clears throat> in the first job that I had, I worked in basically the, the field program where we're flying a, a NOAA P3, which is pictured in the lower left here. I flew in a, a Category 5 hurricane in 79 at 1,500 feet at night and basically experienced uh, the, the worst turbulence that you can for most uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones. So it's a job that you either love or you say, this is not what I want to do. So. Some people determined that uh, turbulence in hurricanes was not their particular passion and left to do something else. So each person has their own uh, attributes. And in this particular case, I loved flying into hurricanes. But it was the second point here, validating satellite observations. NASA had an R&D satellite up and uh, my boss was in charge of helping validate uh, two particular sensors on this satellite. And I quickly learned uh, via workshops and interactions with uh, professionals in the field that this was something that I really thought had a long future ahead of it. So with that in mind, I participated in hurricane flights and we'll show you a little movie clip here. So this is a NOAA P3 uh, flying into uh, an eye of a hurricane. And we're going to show you uh, what the cockpit looks like as we're going from the very calm eye and then through the very turbulent eye wall. So we have a pilot, a co-pilot, an engineer. And note the little green uh, frog emblem that is uh, hanging from the overhead. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch the frog as well as the pilots, the crew members, bounce a little here as we go through the turbulent eye wall. So in other words, you have a, a large mishmash of uh, thunderstorms that are swirling around the eye. And as you go through the eye wall, you can experience anywhere from uh, 1 to 2 Gs up and 1 to 2 Gs down. So these turbulent updrafts and downdrafts can occur very close to one another and uh, basically take things that are in your hand and uh, watch them disappear. So this gives you an idea of um, what actually flying through the eye wall of a hurricane is like. So we'll, we'll also start this one on the bottom. This is flying through Hurricane Felix. 
And the reason for showing you this, as you might imagine, uh, if, we, if we have thunderstorms, there is a considerable amount of uh, lightning possible. And I uh, apologize for the camera here going sideways for a second. But we'll level it back out and you can begin to see some lightning flashes in the eye wall. So this is quite common. It varies considerably from storm to storm. So if you're interested in a career in meteorology, there are a wealth of resources that are available. So for instance, this is from the American Geosciences Institute. Uh, the web page here basically provides a broad view of many fields of interest within geoscience. So atmospheric sciences, geophysics, oceanography, planetary exploration, geology, engineer, and touches upon uh, three aspects, teaching, research, and operations. And the web link at the bottom basically goes into more detail. So when you have uh, an opportunity, these are some web links with considerable resources. Also, the American Meteorological Society has a wealth of information at this website, which addresses things like, would meteorology be a good career for you? It also has profiles and videos of meteorologists from multiple fields, so research, operations, government, etc. And Due to the wonders of the internet, you have the ability to listen to dozens of podcasts from experts in weather, water, as well as climate sciences. So uh, a wealth of tools to look at uh, as time permits. This goes into a, additional tools that the uh, AMS has on their websites, videos, presentations, webinars, again, your ability to view these as you have time. Now they're also listed here on the AMS website, uh, the various colleges and universities that have meteorology programs. So this would include both undergraduate as well as graduate programs. And uh, the number of universities um, providing this uh, instruction has grown considerably uh, over the last couple of decades. So to give you an example of um, a little bit of what satellite meteorology can do, this animation shows um, a wealth of geostationary satellite visible and infrared images uh, that are gleaned from using the suite of geostationary satellites that are positioned around the globe. So the one for North America covers uh, what's called goes east and goes west. Uh, the Europe one, has geostationaries from what's called UMETSAT. The Western Pacific uses uh, one from Japan. And then we also have Africa here uh, with uh, UMETSAT as well. So there are a variety of countries that operate geostationary satellites and this data is freely shared in real time uh, for the good of global meteorology. Now we also have, as you might imagine, uh, a significant interest in what I'll call regional or mesoscale meteorology. So on the uh, left-hand side, we're using one of the European geostationary satellites to look at a low pressure system that you see spinning uh, cyclonically over the North Africa. So what we've been able to do, and this is part of the research that was done in the team that I led with the Naval Research Lab, is to use the multispectral channels in the satellite sensor to discern in yellow uh, what is airborne dust. So in other words, as this low pressure system spins and kicks up dust, it lofts that dust into the air. The strong winds then evict that dust, as you can see over a considerable portion of North Africa. And the distinct colorization that has been able to be used here enables the user to readily identify where airborne dust is located. So this is advantageous for a wide variety of users. So while working at the Naval Research Lab, <clears throat> first uh, doing oceanography, satellite oceanography, 
We used uh, global near real time digital satellite data sets to do things like sea surface temperature, otherwise known as SST, sea surface heights using altimetry to delineate ocean fronts and eddies, uh, passive microwave imagery to basically view sea ice, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, 24-7. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I particularly liked was transitioning R&D products to operations, actually seeing the fruits of your labor. But we also did uh, field programs where we participated in research oceanographic cruises, such as in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we underflew the space shuttle synthetic aperture radar in the Gulf of Mexico with one of the NOAA P3s. And we also underflew the geosat altimeter looking for sea ice in the Barents Sea and ocean fronts and eddies uh, in the Northeast Pacific. So the opportunity to get out of the office, participate and help validate uh, satellite sensors was something that, uh, that I enjoyed. I then transitioned from uh, oceanography back to meteorology here in, in Monterey, California, doing satellite meteorology, again, using global near real time digital satellite data sets with a significant focus on tropical cyclones since that was part of my background. But we also um, generated uh, via research and development hazardous weather characterization. So similar to the dust storms that you saw an example of a moment ago, aircraft icing, ocean surface winds, ship and aircraft routing around bad weather, as you might imagine, being part of the Naval Research Lab. And we also transitioned products to operations. We also had an opportunity to participate in various field programs. So for instance, uh, we went on an aircraft training cruise where we were catapulted uh, off the aircraft carrier, which uh, is definitely in the top three experiences that I've had in my life. In our tropical cyclone field program, we uh, collaborated with NOAA uh, in Saharan air layer experiments using their Gulfstream 4 jet flying out of Barbados in the Atlantic and also Guam-based Air Force C-130 Typhoon flights, um, which uh, per occurred over a period of two different years. So this gives you an example of the uh, Gulfstream jet that NOAA has on the left, and then the NOAA P-3 on the right. And this is actually uh, in Barbados. And on the bottom here, bottom right, we have the uh, what's called a C-2, which is the plane uh, that carries equipment and uh, other supplies uh, to and from uh, the aircraft carrier, which in this case was the USS Eisenhower off of uh, Norfolk. These are some shots from uh, the C-130. This is in Guam as we were flying into Typhoon Nuri, uh, working hand in hand with the Air Force uh, uh, hurricane hunters. These are all folks who are uh, basically are in the Air Force reserves and they participate uh, operationally as tasked by the National Hurricane Center in Miami on a routine basis. So what are the uh, work opportunities? First, we'll touch upon those work opportunities that exist in the research world. So I'll touch upon first the government laboratories. So NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, in the satellite world, the National Environmental Satellite Information Distribution Services, otherwise known as NESDIS, the Naval Research Lab, both in Monterey and Stennis, and then NASA has a variety of centers uh, that touch upon meteorology and oceanography applications, uh, and also with satellite remote sensing. Uh, we spoke briefly about universities with a web link to those with grad and undergrad programs and I should also note that there are joint university government institutes. So for instance, the University of Wisconsin, Colorado State University, University of Miami, as well as University of Oklahoma are joint institutes. And there are several others as well uh, that provide a conduit for researchers to collaborate with um, government researchers within NOAA. I should note 
that there has been a huge growing number of private companies that are doing research. So these are both large and small companies that carry out research ranging from basic research to very applied. Uh, so we have aerospace firms who build weather and ocean sensors. We have companies that advise firms on solutions for specific weather issues. And there is a huge demand for research related to operational solutions, ranging from agriculture, aviation, remote sensing, et cetera. The work opportunities here, as I mentioned, <clears throat> In the government, we have the National Weather Service with off offices located in every state and U.S. territory. They produce multiple forecasts per day for a wide variety of customers. Uh, they do have shift work as well as eight to five jobs, depending on what the job title is. And there is the opportunity for advancements and to move around the country. So you're not uh, set in stone in one particular location for the rest of your career. Uh, no one is this that, as I mentioned, does uh, a plethora of satellite remote sensing product creation, distribution, as well as training. And there are multiple agencies with a wide range of departments that need weather and ocean inputs, such as the Department of Agriculture, Aviation and Commerce, as well as the Department of Defense, which I worked for. To give you an example of uh, remote sensing and how it can uh, greatly assist in tropical cyclone monitoring, here we have a, four different views <clears throat> of uh, Typhoon Nuri as it's forming uh, in the Western Pacific. And basically all you can see is a big blob of clouds. If we take a look at the infrared, again, you see the big blob of clouds. In essence, in essence, we're looking at very cold cloud top temperatures. And until you get to the right hand uh, view of these four panels, you cannot readily discern exactly where the center of the storm is. So we can mitigate or get around that issue by looking at passive microwave imagery from a polar orbiting satellite that in essence enables us to see the internal structure of the storm much clearer than visible in infrared in many instances. By virtue of <clears throat> the heavy rain and ice particles in the rain bands and the eye wall scatter the radiation such that the brightness temperatures uh, more clearly identify the structure of the tropical cyclone. So one of the items that uh, my team created was a near real-time web page that processed these passive microwave images uh, for any active tropical cyclone on the planet and made that available via a web page to all the tropical cyclone warning centers and government war warning agencies around the globe. So work opportunities for operational aspects, not research, there has been an explosion in private companies that are addressing specific weather and ocean product needs from the user community. So this could be commerce, such as shipping and aviation. Uh, who can save the most time and money in terms of ship routing and aircraft routing, especially on long haul uh, flights, say, for instance, from the U.S. West Coast to uh, Asia? or for instance, to uh, Australia. And then there are <clears throat> considerable interests, as you might imagine, in media. So TV and internet based, uh, most folks now have uh, some or a considerable amount of meteorology training. This was not the case, obviously, back in the 70s when, uh, when I was in school. So we have local, regional, as well as national TV's news stations such as the Weather Channel, Weather Nation, CNN, and countless others, big and small, that sell ads and subscriptions um, while providing uh, weather forecast and other tailored products. So what are some of the career options here? And so these are suggestions uh, if you're interested in meteorology as a career choice. Uh, the first question is, what aspect of meteorology piques your interest? Are you interested in broadcast or TV meteorology? Uh, do you have an interest in research? 
uh, or would you like to do something more operationally oriented? Or in my case, it was a, a mix of multiple thrusts. Uh, the second question is, are you taking appropriate courses in high school to help determine if you have, have the right aptitude for various college coursework, such as math and physics? So math and science was uh, what uh, I enjoyed in high school, and that, in essence, uh, helped lead me to uh, a meteorology career. And I can't emphasize uh, item number three enough. How can you get some local experience that will help you determine if this career field is really what you want to do? So there are numerous opportunities, for instance, to shadow a, a local TV or a National Weather Service weather forecaster for a day or more. And I think you'd be uh, pleasantly surprised at how many folks will encourage you to see what they do in a routine workday. There's also the opportunity to find internships and or summer work programs. Some don't require college enroll enrollment in a degree program to participate. And there's also the opportunity to attend open houses at local or regional geoscience centers and labs. So here in Monterey, we have a wealth of meteorology and oceanography uh, operational and research activities. And basically they each have an, an open house, obviously during these COVID times, some of those are uh, less frequent, but they welcome the public to come in and see what they do. And now with the internet uh, being what it is, as we noted earlier with the AMS uh, web links, uh, you have the opportunity to sign up for an exploding number of online webinars from many organizations, and the vast majority of these are free and don't require any uh, particular uh, rigorous registration requirements. So basically, they provide an opportunity to see what uh, opportunities exist. So this last example here, we're looking uh, at a, <clears throat> a polar orbiting satellite sensor that is looking at a typhoon in the Western Pacific. The Philippines are in the lower left. Taiwan is in the upper left. And you can see the city lights uh, that are basically uh, occurring on uh, the side of uh, Taiwan here. And what this sensor does is it's extremely sensitive to uh, the moon illuminating the clouds below. So this is the unprocessed image. And by doing a number of calculations, we can create this image. Basically turning what looks, what used to be nighttime visible imagery into what is closely resembling daytime visible imagery. So as you can imagine, as we go back to that versus this, the tropical cyclone analysts would be provided considerably more information on the location and the structure of the rain bands and the eye wall versus with the enhanced image using this nighttime visible product. And then we also have this, again, we're using geostationary, um, excuse me, polar orbiter uh, nighttime visible data, and we've ha enhanced it in a certain way. We're looking at the rim fire, which uh, is in California, just northwest of uh, Yosemite National Park. And the, whoops, the, sorry, we'll start it over again. There we go. You can actually see the fire perimeter grow Basically, we're looking at the fire illumination. It's giving off uh, visible uh, reflectances here that we're able to see um, basically the glow from the fire in the infrared and the actual light that it's emitting. So this can come in handy for a variety of uh, fire applications. So we have some uh, uh, career guides here, uh, additional links that are potentially of interest to folks that are looking at uh, meteorology as a career. 
And I should note, um, since I had a significant interest in marine biology, but uh, decided meteorology was what I wanted to spend my life doing, uh, now that I'm retired, I have uh, switched back to uh, marine biology in the context of volunteering at what's called the Marine Mammal Center. Basically, we are first responders for injured uh, or sick sea lions, elephant seals, fur seals, harbor seals, and porpoises. We rescue them when the public sends in reports over about 600 miles of the central California coast. We treat them with medications that are directed by a uh, vet staff, uh, provide them with fluids and feed them, and then we transport them to our vet hospital up in Sausalito, California, which is the largest marine mammal uh, vet center in the world. Uh, so the goal here is to rehabilitate and then release them back into the wild when they're health healthy. And I also volunteer for the Marine Life Studies, which is a, another nonprofit that carries out whale, porpoise, and turtle surveys in Monterey Bay. So we photo ID whales and porpoises, as well as killer whales, orcas, and which we have just generated a uh, first of its kind catalog, and do this while uh, viewing humpbacks, gray whales, blue whales, fin whales, bards, beaked whales, which I had never heard of before, and killer whales, which are just uh, amazing critters uh, to view and follow. So with that, I'll uh, end there. And Jen, I'll be glad to take any questions that you have. Great. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I love those videos inside of the storms. Um, <clears throat> that's one of those things you always see on TV. You're like, that'd be so cool to get out there and go fly into an eye of a hurricane. Um, so with that, you know, there's so much different tools and technology on board those planes. So when you guys are actually flying through those storms, what specific data are you really looking for? So there's three different sets of data. One is the aircraft obviously is instrumented with a wide variety of meteorological uh, sensors. So wind, temperature, humidity, pressure. Um, and we also have airborne radar on board. So both um, in the belly of the aircraft and in the tail of the aircraft that basically enables both horizontal and vertical slices of uh, precipitation. We have probes that we drop. So there are two different types of probes. A, a drop sign basically measures uh, wind, temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, and this data is fed back uh, in real time uh, to be used by the hurricane forecast models. So all the models that you see the TV meteorologist and the National Weather Service use uh, basically ingest this vital data that helps the models uh, better forecast the track and the intensity. Um, the last one, there's a, a probe that you saw a short picture of me dropping. It's uh, called an airborne expendable bathothermograph. And basically what it does is you drop it, <clears throat> it hits the water and floats there for a while. It drops a thermistor or a temperature probe such that you can profile the, uh, the temperature and uh, in some cases the salinity as well to a depth of a uh, thousand feet. And so it tells you what the thermal structure of the ocean is, which potentially has an impact on the storm's intensity. Great. So, you know, over, you've had such a long career in meteorology and I'm sure there's been just so many advances as you're going along. So really, you know, how has the advancements in those satellites that you were working with really influenced the way we study those tropical cyclones? The amount, uh, so I mentioned that the, uh, the track forecasting for tropical cyclones around the world has improved uh, dramatically, obviously, in the 40 years of my career. And a, a good chunk of that is due to uh, the advancement in satellite remote sensing. So we now have um, basically a suite of satellite sensors uh, that enable us to probe the atmosphere, whether it's clear or cloudy and or raining, uh, such that we can adequately, or I should say much better, uh, stipulate what the temperature and moisture is in the atmosphere from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere 
uh, around the planet using uh, these satellite remote sensing sensors. So as you might imagine, uh, since we have things like radio signs over land, um, whether it's the U.S. or Europe, uh, Asia, et cetera, um, that we have a fair amount of data over land. But that is not the case over water. So with that in mind, satellite remote sensing fills that data gap. And the advancement of those sensors has been a big uh, contribution, as well as the advancement in numerical weather modeling in, con in, in conjunction to get to uh, the fine state that we're in today. Great. So, you know, you said you grew up in Florida and went through some of those bigger storms. Um, I know that there's certain ones that have really made an impact. For example, Hurricane Andrew changed a lot of how we deal with how we remediate from hurricanes and the way we build our structures. Uh, we've also seen some storms that have just been so intense recently, like Dorian and Maria. Um, so for you, what was your most memorable storm? Um, basically two storms. Um, Hurricane Donna came through uh, Miami when I was, um, let's see, what, how old was I? <laughs> Ten. Um, and... Uh, my dad was flying in storms at the time. So uh, obviously he was not home. So my mom and my sister and I prepared the house and we moved our mattresses into the hallway and a storm came by. Fortunately, um, uh, the house survived just fine. It was, uh, there was plenty of water outside, but the house was fine. So as you might imagine, uh, sleeping in the hallway, and hearing the wind go uh, lickety split through the trees uh, left an indelible impression. And flying through uh, Hurricane David, which was a Category 5, uh, at 1,500 feet at night was, uh, yeah, that was an eye-opener. Um, it was, you know, it was, uh, people ask me, you know, how the hell can you do something like that? And it's because you're, Number one, your, your physical constitution, you know, some people are emotion sensitive, others aren't. Obviously, I'm not. Um, but you're so focused on what you're doing, even though it's a 10 or 11 hour flight, um, uh, you are, you have a specific job and you're basically concentrating the vast majority of the time. So you're oblivious mm, to the extent possible <laughs> of what's going on around you. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to fly through an eye of a Category 5 storm. That must be just absolutely of an, like an adrenaline rush. It, it, is, uh, it, is, it is a career high. Um, <laughs> so, like I said, it's either something that you love with a passion or you want to change jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, it, meant it, it was passionate for you because you kept doing it. So. <laughs> Um, I have a couple, uh, a question about, you know, you talked about the dust plumes a little bit and, you know, we always see on the news about the Saharan dust cloud and there's all kinds of misinformation that gets put out there, misconceptions with the kids. So can you provide any insight into the actual impact that the Saharan dust cloud has on storm development? So, yes, uh, typically um, so Saharan air layer or sal as we call it in the meteorology field, um, typically has a, a max uh, in the early summer. So June, July, and maybe into parts of August is the typical, but it, it does change from year to year. So the Saharan air layer, basically you have these pulses of very warm, dry, stable air, and they cover huge areas. Um, there are plenty of videos uh, online that, that give you some examples. So these can expand and cover, you know, say half of the, of the tropical Atlantic as they come off uh, the western coast of Africa and propagate all the way across into the Caribbean and, for instance, even into uh, Florida and the Gulf of Mexico on occasion. So as they move across, basically this dry, stable air inhibits or basically is a non-fertile ground for 
hurricanes to form. So while you may have some uh, weak circulations that would be uh, incipient hurricanes, uh, if they encounter uh, this Saharan air layer, um, they can either die as a result or they can wait to develop until they become more distant or further apart from the Saharan air layer. So this is part of what Noah was studying in the, uh, the G4 study that I showed you a slide of. And so this has now uh, been more accurately modeled within the numerical weather prediction community and basically uh, keeping an eye on when this dry stable air potentially gets entrained or wrapped into a tropical cyclone it can cause the storm to um, cease intensification or in some cases decay. Great. Yeah, that's it. I hear so many different things coming out about that. And a lot of students of mine in the past have been like, oh, we're going to have all these storms. Like, oh, there's a whole lot more to it. So it's really <laughs> nice to hear it coming from a meteorologist <laughs> um, as far as what's actually going on there. So there... There are many factors, uh, and so uh, the folks, for instance, at the National Hurricane Center use a wealth of information. A significant portion of that comes from satellite remote sensing, and there are derived products that they utilize to ascertain every six hours uh, what the next track and intensity forecast is going to be. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for all that information. That was so cool seeing all those videos and hearing about all the amazing projects that you've participated in. If you would like more information about this talk or any other of our Lunch with the Scientist programs, you can go ahead and email us at info at headwaterscienceinstitute.org. Now, Jeff Hawk also talked to us about, you know, getting some of that hands-on experience and doing some possible networking. And we actually do provide a really cool opportunity called the Research Experience. You can go ahead and visit our website here to get more information. Our summer program is actually available right now for you to register. Um, and you can do studies like meteorology or looking at hurricane development and tracking as one of those research projects. So again, if you'd like more information, go ahead and visit that website or email us at info at headwaterscience.org. So thank you again, Jeff, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and, and teach us all about um, hurricanes and what it's like to be a meteorologist. Thank you, Jan. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great day.